You, you like going on television, though. I like going on your show. Yeah. I remember when I was growing up in Canada and you'd take over Much Music. Oh, that was so fun. Which is different than MTV, obviously. You yeah. take over MTV, too. But in Canada, we saw you take over Much Music. That was fun. I get to just run around the street. I did stuff not too dissimilar from the kind of stuff you do. I just run up to people on the street and just annoy them. Yeah, yeah. Well, basically, <laughs> I, I was basically copying you, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was watching you take over Much Music and go, someday I want to take over Much Music. So. Yeah, that's amazing. So, and now when, when, when you started making music, you, you, you started playing with an accordion. Right. And you, 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 there was the first hit you did, was it My was it my Bologna? Yeah, My Bologna. You have that a clip a... of My Bologna. Oh, oh I excellent. We, I thought we could just look at a clip let's of My Bologna. Let's look at that, shall yeah, we? Yeah, let's look at a clip. This is, uh, is this, this is, is this that? <laughs> <laughs> Has it started yet? No, no, they haven't. Oh, I don't think they heard us. Oh, shit. <laughs> This was last year. Yeah. <laughs> so how old were you here? I was, uh, I think, 19 years old. Okay. A, a friend of mine did this for his uh, school senior project. Yeah. Because he was doing like some kind of uh, uh, audiovisual thing, and he wanted, hey, I want to make a music video for you. I was like, all right, fine. What kind of grade did he get? Uh, probably C. Yeah. C D. <laughs> <laughs> and you were an architecture student, and you were also making music for fun, right. and you recorded this song, gave it to a Dr. Demento radio show, and that's how it all started. Yeah, I, w yeah. I was going to college at the time, getting my degree in architecture, and I recorded that song, My Bologna, uh, in the men's bathroom across the hall from our college campus radio station. Because I, I was 19, I couldn't afford to go into a real recording studio but the bathroom had these acoustically perfect tiled walls and uh, that was the uh, recording from the bathroom that you heard there uh, which got released as a single on Capitol Records and that fine music video was made from it yeah so the actual recording from the bathroom got released on Capitol yeah, Records on you Capitol. didn't, didn't re-record it well or? we re-recorded it for my first album uh -huh, okay now here's here's how the record industry works when I uh, gave Capitol Records my bathroom recording which didn't cost me anything to make uh, they paid me five hundred dollars for the rights to the master and I thought, that $500 free dollars. I just made $500. <laughs> and then when I got signed to a different record label and I wanted to re-record my Bologna for my first album, they charged me $1,000 just for the right to re-record it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is how the, this is how you, that's why it's called the music business. Right, sure. Is, is, is this, is, did you learn from this and this is how you've sort of become such a, a you know, a brilliant marketer? You kind of learned, learned to work never around to record it? in a bathroom again. Those, yeah. <laughs> those days are over. Only 24 track digital bathrooms from now on. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Okay, Jeffrey in Michigan, let's take a call. We want to get as many Skype callers on as we can because uh, they're lined up to talk to you, Al. Uh, Jeffrey, go ahead with your question. Hey there, gentlemen. Thank you for having me on. Uh, my question for Weird Al is, uh, who was the toughest person to get permission from to go ahead with the album? Oh, yeah, and uh, congratulations for that number one spot, Al. Thank you, man. Um, well, on this album... Not that they were tough, but, you know, uh, the Iggy Azalea parody was something that came up at the last minute. And, you know, uh, usually we have a little bit more time to, to get permissions in and get phone calls returned. But we were on a serious time deadline because I, I had uh, July 15th slotted in for the release of the album. I figured, OK, got to master the album here. We're going to mix it here, going to record it here. And I have to get permission from Iggy Azalea by this particular date and the clock was ticking and we weren't hearing back from management and we weren't hearing back hearing back and finally I was like I don't want to delay the release of the album I got to track her down and and talk to her in person so I bought a plane ticket I flew out to Denver where she was doing a live show and I just waited by the side of the stage <laughs> it was like it a, was like a stalker very much yeah. like a stalker yeah. in fact TMZ said I ambushed her uh -huh. which they would know about ambushing I guess yeah but uh, yeah. but I, I was by the side of the stage and as she walked off the stage she said I, I said, well, uh, Iggy, hi, I'm uh, Al Yankovic, and I'd like to do a parody of your song, Fancy, and put it on my next album. And she, you know, she was a little taken aback, because I'm sure she didn't know I was there or what I was doing there. And she said, I, I would need to know some more information about it. And I said, I happen to have the lyrics right here. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's kind of looking at her, and she's like, uh, okay. And she's looking at the lyrics, and she says, Seems okay. Uh -huh, said, uh -huh. Thank you very much. And I walked back to LA and recorded the song. Right. That, uh, that's amazing that you you do get the permission er, every time. Right? Yes, they do. And sometimes they don't give you permission. And when they don't give you permission, you can still release it on the well, internet. Or, or it, it's extremely rare. I mean, a, an artist hasn't really turned me down since like Prince back in the '80s. Uh, but you know, the, to, to answer your question, I, I probably could get away with it. I mean, the law is very 
gray in terms of you know legalities and parodies, and I, I could I could probably do it anyway, but that's not how that's not how I roll, Tom. Most most artists, most musicians now, when you show up at their concert, must think I've made it. Weird Al's here; he wants to do a parody of my song. <laughs> That's it's that's that's got to be a real uh, sign a lot, of a having made they, it. All the times they stop the concert midway, like excuse me, everybody. Yeah. Alf here. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, uh, and you 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 you've outlasted the careers of many of the people that you've parodied as well. Yeah, it kind of seems that way. Um, it's 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 an amazing thing. Uh, yeah, a lot of artists look at it as a badge of honor, a sign that they've reached a, reached a certain plateau in their careers. You know, it's it's said that you, you get your gold album, then you get your Grammy award. And then you get your Weird Al parody. Then you know you've truly made it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you called up and spoke to Kurt Cobain on the phone. I did. Asked yep. for permission to do "Smells Like Nirvana." Yeah, and that was a very, uh, a very similar situation where my manager wasn't getting his phone calls returned, and he said, "If if you want to do this Nirvana parody, it's on you." Um, so I, uh, I uh, uh, called Kurt Cobain when he was doing Saturday Night Live for the first time, got him on the phone, and uh, over the phone I just asked him if I could do uh, "Smells Like Nirvana." And, and he said, well, oh, sure, is it going to be a song about food? And I said, no, it's going to be a song about how nobody can understand your lyrics. <laughs> and he said, yeah, okay, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. So it's amazing that you know, most people are a good sport about it. And, uh, and you got to know Michael Jackson uh, famously after you did Eat It and I'm Fat. And did, was that, did that affect you uh, when, when he passed away? That must have oh. affected you. You got to know him. Pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we we weren't super close, but I met him a few times, and and more than that, I mean, he really meant a lot to me in my career. I mean, uh, doing the, Mike, the Michael Jackson parodies really jumpstarted my career. The fact that he gave me his permission back in 1984, when you know very few people even knew who I was, I mean, that was a big deal. I mean, he just he just liked the parodies. He he thought they were funny, and and he uh, gave me his blessing, which meant that like everybody else that was sort of waffling, going. Yeah, I don't know about this Weird Al guy. All of a sudden, it's like, well, if Michael Jackson thinks it's okay, I guess he's all right. We have a clip from Eat It here. Uh, I've, I've heard you describe yourself as having an uncanny resemblance to Michael Jackson uh, in the uh, video. Uh, we, let's have a look at the clip from Eat It right now. Yeah. This was... Uh, This is my favorite part right here. Right here. Talking up the. Yeah. Oh, it cut away before oh, the part. It cut yeah. away before yeah, after the part. After the video came out, a lot of people confused me with Michael Jackson. Yeah. It, was, uh, it, was, it was difficult. <laughs> that was uh, that was just an amazing time. I mean, you know, I was uh, probably uh, you know in the uh, maybe I was 13 years old when when that came out. When Michael Jackson came out, it was right. the first time music had seemed so you know, big when with Michael Jackson for me as a kid. And then when this came out and there was comedy involved. That was that was a done deal for me. 